Hello, my name is Benji Mehta. I'm a PhD student from the University of Melbourne, my final year, studying astronomy. But I'm not going to be talking to you about astronomy. I'm not even going to be talking to you about AI. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the probability that underpins the statistics, that underpins the data science, that underpins the AI. So we're going a few levels deep. Um, bear with me. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be telling you about a really cool textbook that I read that gives a new interpretation to kind of like what probability theory is, how we should think about it, kind of like what it means from sort of like a fundamental first principles level. It's going to be fun, I promise. Um, so we're going to start things off with a thought experiment. So this scientist is going to take you, he sits you down in a room, and he says, I am going to flip a coin, and I want you to tell me whether you think it's more likely to be heads, more likely to be tails, or the same outcome. So we're going to start with that. Um, who reckons it's more likely to be heads? Who, okay, cool. Pro heads crowds. Tails? A couple of them, tails over tails. Um, who thinks it's going to be even? All right. Not most of you. That's interesting. <laughs> all right. So the first coin gets flipped. Yeah? First coin gets flipped, lands tails, and he's like, all right, now we're going to do it again. I'm going to flip this coin. Who reckons it's going to be heads? It's the same coin. He picks it back up. Who reckons it's going to be tails? Who reckons it's equal probability? All right. We're going to do it again. Who reckons it's going to be heads? Who reckons it's going to be tails? Same probability? Great. He keeps flipping the coin. He gets another heads. And then he gets, and he gets another tails. And then he gets another tails <laughs> five more times in a row. All right. At this point, he's going to tell you the same thing. Who reckons it's going to be heads? Who reckons it's going to be tails? Who reckons it's still the same probability? We've got about an even split now, which is exactly what we're looking for. Um, now I'm going to give you some more information. This guy looks like he's smiling kind of mischievously, and he looks like he's having a good time with this. He's ready to flip the next coin. Who reckons it's going to be heads? Who reckons it's going to be tails? Who reckons it's the same probability? Okay, great. You guys, you've split the room, which is perfect, because this is exactly the split that divides the two main schools of thought that people use to think about probability theory. Frequentists and Bayesians. And this is my favorite thing, because it points this divide so point on. Um, frequentists will look at this experiment and say that if you're changing your mind, if you're saying anything other than it's going to be the same probability each time, you're committing something called the gambler's fallacy, and you're being a bad scientist. Um, on the other hand, if you talk to a Bayesian, they will say that as soon as that first tails lands, if you don't change your mind, you are not taking into account all of the observational evidence that is available to you. You're ignoring things, you're misleading yourself, and you're being a bad scientist. <laughs> Maybe. This is where the hero of the story comes in, E.T. James. And I had to use this photo of him because look at it. <laughs> so who is E.T. James? Um, he was a physicist from the 21st century. Um, 20th, 20th century. Um, and his most famous thing was to connecting um, thermodynamics with information theory. Um, Unfortunately, he died in Canada in 1998. Um, the textbook that I'm talking about actually came out in 2003. So it was finished by a colleague of his who collated like 40 years of his lecture notes, put it all together, and he was, it's got a really like sad kind of preface to it where he talks about how all of these lecture notes had much more coming in the notes of these books, much more coming, and it didn't. And so rather than finish the kind of like books with his own words, he said, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to like curate it as well as I can, and I'm going to present it in his own words. Um, so what does he talk about? Um, this is the book. It's available on Amazon, probably. I haven't checked, <laughs> unless ChatGPT ever can like it. But we're going to take away, the goal of it is to kind of like extend logical reasoning to scenarios where we don't know things for sure, but we still want to extract as much information as we can um, in a consistent, rational way to like help make decisions. So we're going to start with a few axioms of classic logical reasoning. If you know them, play along at home. Um, if A implies B and A is true, then B is, B is true. We love it. And if A implies B and B is false, then A is, A is false. We all know it so well. If all crows are black and it's not black, it's not a crow. If all crows are black and it's a crow, then it's black. We're sort of, since you were knee high, you all knew this. Um, so now we've got a new one. If A implies B and B is true, what can we conclude about A? Nothing for sure. <laughs> so if I find you down a dark alley over my father's body in a pool of blood with his blood on your hands, you could have tripped and fallen out of the, over that body in the dark. But it also means that it is more plausible 
that you more murdered him. And so we want a way to be able to make inferences like this from incomplete data as well. And the other one is if A implies B and A is false, and that means that B is not necessarily false, you know? Smoking causes cancer. If I don't smoke, I could still get cancer, but I do want to be able to conclude that it's less plausible that I'll get cancer if this happened. So we're trying to extend the rules of logical inference to apply to scenarios where we maybe don't have certain information, such as everything we encounter in the real world ever. So how do we do this? This is the goal. We want to formalize this system of inference to let us make these kind of deductions in a way that is qualitative, not quantitative, I mean, quantitative, that should say, um, numbers. We want like definite ways of how much we know something. How do we assign a degree of belief in something we can like show to someone? We want it to be consistent and we want it to agree with our own common sense notions about how certain about these things we should be. So let's start off with some desiderata. What do we want this system to have? Um, the first one that he asks for is we want things to be represented by real numbers. Um, good reasons to use real numbers is that you can compare two of them and they're always one's bigger than the other, smaller than the other, or the same. If you have like two different numbers then all of a sudden things get fuzzy. You could use rational numbers, but why would you? So we're just going for real numbers. That's the first thing that we're requiring. The second thing we're requiring is that when we decide how much we should believe a certain statement, we should take into account all of the background information that we know. We shouldn't leave anything out. And the third thing that we ask for is consistency. If I am equally ignorant about three different possible outcomes, I should believe in all of them the same amount. And that's it. That is all the things that I want. That is all the ifs that I want in this theorem. Everything that comes after this is a consequence of wanting these three things to be true, insisting that they're true, and working forward from them. So let's tell you some results. Let's see how far you can get just wanting these three things. The first thing you get is that the thing which is certain should have one of these plausibilities assigned to it of exactly one. So if something's true, Boolean value should be one. Uh, this is not an axiom. This is not a convention. This is the thing that you get out of the theory in chapter two. It's a derivation. It's a result. I think that's awesome. Second one, you might guess where it's going. If something is false, there's actually two different ways that you can define it. You can either say that it has a value of zero or a value of infinity. Both would be valid. We all decide to use zero, and this time it is just a convention. Um, but sure, that's where it comes from. These are the reasons why we have zero for false, one for true. Now the next one is gonna be a law about how can we use these degrees of belief in a way to like make compound statements. If I believe A, this much given my background information, and B, this much given my background information, how much should I believe that A and B are both happening? And the thing that turns out is this rule that looks pretty similar to some of you. This is Bayes' theorem, as it's classically known, um, with a little conditional C, conditional on your background information that you know. So probability of A given A and B given C, probability of A given both B and C, times the probability of B given C. This isn't a consequence in this theorem, this is one of the fundamental building blocks for how you're supposed to multiply these probabilities together. No, this is a result. From these things that we insisted, consistency, things are represented by real numbers, and that um, we take into account all background information, this comes out as the natural way to multiply two things together. And the last result that I'm gonna show you is this negation rule that comes out. Probability of not A given C is one minus the probability of A given C. And that's actually all that we need to fully define this system. Because if you have and, and you have not, you can make any logical compound statement out of just those two unitary operations. You can make ors, you can make implies, you can make everything just out of these two things. Yeah. Okay. Right, so in this theorem, there is no such thing as a probability without background information. So I could ask you, what, what are the odds that a candle weighs more than 40 grams? You can't tell me without background information. It's the same in any theory of probability. <laughs> yeah, so I'll show you it in practice, right? Um, I wanna know the truth value of the statement, um, this die will land on a six. And we're gonna work it from, through it from scratch using just the three axioms we've provided. Um, so the first thing that we know, we need some background information. We can't have a probability without background information. Everything depends on what we believe. Um, so we've got six different hypotheses. We're equally ignorant about all of them, so we should believe them all equally. 
And we also know that these two, six different options are all mutually exclusive and exhaustive. It's gotta be one of them, it can't be two of them. So we know that each of these probabilities have to be equal because we're equally ignorant about all of them. And we know that they have to sum to be one, so they have to sum to certainty. And so that gives us the thing of like the probability of one of these dies landing on a six has to be one in six. Now, how do I interpret that? It is relevant to the background information. If I had different background information, I would get a different value for how certain things are. A die rolling is not a intrinsically random process. I can make a machine that always, if I put a one on the top, will always roll me a six when it comes out. And if I knew how this machine worked, I would not believe this to be a one in six probability. I believe it to be certain. If I had a machine but I didn't know how it works, I might believe it differently, and after a few trials, I might update my beliefs. So everything is calculated relevant to the background information that you know beforehand. Um, and that's kind of all that I have for you <laughs> um, in terms of like prepared content, but I'm ready to like take some questions. So the key two takeaway messages, all probabilities are conditional, and all these probabilities represent incomplete information. In this framework, um, statistics becomes the right way to logically handle incomplete information and optimally process it so that we can learn the best we can about this uncertain world. Uh, thank you. Um, so it's like you want to take into account all relevant information is the keyword. So if it's not relevant information, it doesn't really matter. Um, I don't know much about what causality. Does that answer it? Or? Okay. Right. So my, my best answer for this is that this is kind of like the best thing to use whenever you have something that is uncertain. And so that could be if the cause doesn't necessarily imply the effect, but it makes it more likely, then this would be the right thing to do there. Um, it works for random things because if something's random in nature, you definitely don't know how it's gonna imply. But if there's anything that you yourself are unsure about, but you have some knowledge, this is the way to kind of like figure out how much you should believe that, given the knowledge that you do have. Find me at the pub. <laughs> If your model that this is a fair coin is correct, are you sure? Are you sure it's a fair coin? Are you sure it's a fair coin? <laughs> if it's a fair coin, yeah, exactly. Conditional on the fact that it is a fair coin, you're absolutely right. But I didn't tell you it was a fair coin. So if you don't have that in your background information, then you have a different probability. Different probabilities for different background information. So yeah, I, as, as a prior, I'd believe like maybe there's one in 10 million coins are fake. And then as I get more and more evidence, I could compare those two hypotheses and say, based on the fact that I saw eight tails in a row, maybe I believe that it's a biased coin a little bit more. Um, and then as I keep going, maybe I change my beliefs as I go along. No, 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 I'm not saying fake stuff. I'm saying unknown models. No one's sure about, it. in the frequencies framework, you implicitly believe that you are certain that your model is right, but I'm not certain of anything. I do astronomy. We don't know anything about the universe. <laughs> so those, yeah, those classical axioms. So these ones, I think the original proof was um, done by someone <laughs> called Cox in 1959, but it is in this textbook. And uh, yeah, you should read it because it's got a lot of fun quotes in it as well. He's a nice writer. <laughs> yeah, the first two chapters kind of build up this theory from nothing. <laughs>